Hi, my name is Amanda Gillen. I'm the Director of Learning at the Frick Pittsburgh, and I thank you for joining me for um, this talk, which is the second in a four-part series we are doing on Eagle Rock, which was the summer home of the Frick family in Pride's Crossing, Massachusetts. Um, like all of you, we are working from home and um, are working hard to be creative and think about the kinds of online content that we can uh, present for you and with you. Um, so please stay tuned for um, a lot more to come in, in the upcoming weeks, um, both talks like this that you can watch and also some participatory programs as well. Um, the first um, talk in this series was done by my colleague, Dawn Breen, and she talked about Eagle Rock as a home, its construction, its design, and really took a look at its creation in all of its splendor. Um, at the end of her talk, she shared some lovely photos of Frick family members and friends um, enjoying themselves in a lot of different ways at the Eagle Rock property. And it is here that I really want to uh, pick up my part of the conversation. So if you'll bear with me for one minute, I'm going to share my PowerPoint with us all. So here you see Eagle Rock um, in all of its glory. The Frick family begins to vacation on Boston's North Shore in 1902. They rented homes there for several summers and then built Eagle Rock, their own home, which was ready for their use in 1906. Um, the house was enormous, as you can see. It had over 100 rooms and it was used by the family throughout the summer months every year through the 1960s. So these are the photos that I mentioned that Dawn showed at the end of her talk. Um, lovely photos of people having a wonderful time. And I want to spend my few minutes with you talking about the domestic servants and really the hard work that was behind every glamorous house party, every elegant dinner, every picnic on the beach, and really behind all of the day-to-day -day activities that included keeping track of and keeping up with a busy family who moved around a lot, um, particularly Mr. Frick, who was often hopping between New York City and Pittsburgh and Pride's Crossing. Um, some of the programming that is best received by our visitors are the programs um, that have to do with the domestic staff and really the behind the scenes systems and work that went into making life in extraordinary homes like Clayton and Eagle Rock possible. The nature of archival materials, um, which are sometimes sporadically kept and saved with pages missing or sections missing or things not saved at all, um, really makes it challenging to figure out exactly how and where the domestic staff were working and, and when. Fortunately, in addition to saving a lot of their things, the Frick family also kept incredible records of household receipts, letters, and payroll accounts that reveal a great deal to us about the lives, about their lives, and the lives of the people who worked for them. Um, since we are all at home um, for the foreseeable future, um, if you have an interest in Clayton and these archival materials, or, or particularly photographs, um, this might be a fun time for you to do some exploring on the Frick Art Reference Library website. Um, all of the papers that pertain to daily life at Clayton uh, and the Frick family's time in Pittsburgh are kept at the Frick Art Reference Library, which is adjacent to the Frick Collection in New York. Um, if you go to the, the Frick Art Reference Library or FARL website, um, you can search for the section on the Frick Family Papers, and within that you can find digitized online family photo albums. Um, it is in there that you will see these photos, um, photos circa 1900, 1901 of Clayton itself, a lot of the Frick Family travel photos. Um, it's really a wonderful and fun thing to explore if you have some time. Our curatorial and learning staff at the Frick Pittsburgh use the documents and all of the things kept at the Frick Art Reference Library to better understand life at Clayton. These are an incredible resource for us as we try to um, understand and interpret life in this house. So here is uh, an image. Um, if you've been to Clayton or done any of our programs, um, you may recognize some of these faces. Um, these are some of the domestic staff, some of the servants who worked 
for the Frick family at Clayton here in Pittsburgh. Um, on the left, you see Mary Coyne, who started in the 1890s uh, as a maid with the family. She appears on many, many payroll records. Um, and she actually stays behind in Pittsburgh when the family leaves for New York and, and leaves Pittsburgh in 1905 and becomes a housekeeper at Clayton um, well into the 19 teens and, and perhaps beyond. In the center, we have Spencer Ford, longtime chef of the Frick family, who also um, stays behind in Pittsburgh and then eventually moves to Washington, D.C. On, on his own later. Um, and on the far right is James Elmore, who was um, a prominent coachman who the Fricks hired. Um, he was originally from Philadelphia. He starts with the family in the late mid to late 1890s and um, actually winds up moving permanently to Pride's Crossing. Um, Massachusetts um, to care for the carriages and the horses, and that's where he ends his career with the family. Um, you will hear more about James Elmore from my colleague, Kim Cady, who is um, the assistant curator for the Car and Carriage Museum at the Frick Pittsburgh. Um, she will be talking about him and other um, related things in our next segment of this talk. Um, the years between 1900 and 1905 brought a lot of change to the Frick family and to their domestic staff. In 1905, the Fricks leave Pittsburgh for New York City, um, and they take up residence at the home, <clears throat> excuse me, the former home of uh, William H. Vanderbilt at 645th Avenue. Um, after 1900, 1902, the Fricks, particularly Mr. and Mrs. Frick, began spending a lot of time in New York. And after 1905, most of their time is in New York, uh, in Pride's Crossing, and um, traveling around the world. The Frick Art Reference Library has payroll records from the early 1890s, really into the 1920s. Um, but there is a gap of missing records from 1897 to 1904. So we don't know in that period exactly what staff changes took place. Um, but really, this is a, a moment for us to pause and think about what it felt like for the servants who, you know, were working at Clayton in the early 1900s and no doubt felt that change was coming. Um, the family was starting to live differently and, and they couldn't, I'm sure, help but wonder what effect it would have on them. Uh, changes in, in where and the ways in which the Fricks were living meant changes for the domestic staff. Suddenly, after years of living primarily in Pittsburgh, the family's attention was turning away from our city and toward other things. And that meant changes and different work and perhaps increased work um, for the servants. Most, it seems like most of the Pittsburgh staff stayed in Pittsburgh. They either continued to work at Clayton, um, Mary Coyne is an example of this. Even though the Fricks leave Pittsburgh essentially in 1905, they do come back to the home periodically throughout the year. They spend Christmas at Clayton um, for many years. Um, and so they leave staff behind. There are grounds people and um, housekeepers and others who keep take care of, of Clayton, take care of the house while the family is away, and then get it ready for the family when they return. Um, Spencer Ford stays in Pittsburgh. And another person who stays in Pittsburgh and on the Pittsburgh payroll is David Frazier, who is their longtime head groundskeeper. Um, a couple of the staff members make the transition out of Pittsburgh with the family, including James Elmore, who I mentioned, who you see on the right. Um, Elmore becomes a permanent and integral part of life at Eagle Rock. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples of the kinds of payroll records that let us um, know what we know about, about the people who are to the Frick family. Um, even when you have records, there are still mysteries to sort out. Um, it's an effort that takes time and persistence. And I will say that it is a longstanding dream of our uh, education and curatorial departments that we get to find the time eventually over the years to really um, delve deeply into all of these payroll records that transverse the time the Fricks lived at Clayton and also New York um, to truly map and research the um, staff members who worked for them and to Put together a sequence of who was working you know, where and when. Um, this payroll um, sheet that you see here is from May of 1906 um, and I'm showing this to you because this is an example of the kind of blended payroll that is happening as the Fricks are living in various places. So at the top of this document you see Clayton um, listed and there you see Spencer Ford's name, $40 a month, Mary Coyne, uh, Nellie Lupton who is likely um, a, a, another maid perhaps, and then below that David Frazier who I mentioned as head groundskeeper, and then below him um, 
essentially a lot of, I, I believe, lawn workers, garden workers who were helping um, David Frazier. So below that section, that's kind of the people who are working and staying at Clayton, you see the Pride's crossing list of payroll. And at the top of that list is James Elmore, who is well paid comparatively at $80 a month. He's got several stable hands boarding with him below, and then you see some other names toward the bottom. Um, this is interesting because it, there are a number of payroll records, many, many years that look like this, where we are only seeing kind of a skeleton crew of staff listed for Pride's Crossing. And that was um, mysterious and interesting until we finally um, came, were able to look at payroll um, from later years. And I have an example of that to show you. Here we go, August 1912. And this is the first month where we were able to finally see the rest of the staff who would have been um, part of what would be an enormous Eagle Rock staff to be able to um, care for the linens and the dishes and the food and the dusting and the washing and scrubbing um, for a 100 plus room home. So when you look at this payroll, you see the Clayton um, folks at the top, um, a couple of name changes there, but um, Mary Coyne is, is still on, on payroll, this is David Frazier. When you, when you look at Prize Crossing, you see James Elmore and you see some of the names from before, but then you go down below and you see a name, Miss Ratcliffe, and she is listed at the top of the domestic staff for the household as housekeeper. Um, this is interesting, and this must have been a sort of a change in the payroll records. Um, Miss Ratcliffe appears here and continues in each section from then on um, with really wonderful titles for each staff member so we know what they were. Um, for example, four chambermaids, um, we have a butler, a second man, a third man, an odd man, a night watchman. Um, a notation written, it's cut off here, but on, the, on this paper, um, it's written sideways, reads, checked with receipt book from Miss Ratcliffe. Miss R taken receipts in her book. Um, so our guess is that Miss Ratcliffe, as the housekeeper, was somehow handling the household staff separately. And then at this point in August of 1912, they decided to integrate record keeping of the two. So again, there's lots to be done to kind of investigate who these people were and how they worked for the family and where they worked. Um, the archival materials at the Frick Art Reference Library are full of very official looking documents, full of receipts and um, invoices and, you know, grocery receipts and clothing and a lot of sort of typical things. Um, the files in the archives are also full of surprises and wonderful little things that were somehow kept and saved for, you know, over a hundred years that give us glimpses as to the work that these um, domestic servants were doing to keep the Frick households plural running. Um, this is a wonderful note. It, it was, I found this in the archives on one of, of my visits. Um, Frick Education and Curatorial staff uh, go to the archives. We try to go once a year to look at these documents in person. Um, a lot of things are digitized and, and we work very closely with the archivists there, um, but there is nothing like sitting down with a paper file and being able to um, find surprises like this. So this is a note dated June 11th, and I don't know what year, um, but this is just a small communication between staff, really, of the type that made everything function for the household and the family. Um, and June 11th, James Elmore writes to Mr. McElroy, who was um, one of a series of private secretaries who worked for Henry Clay Frick. And these private secretaries handled business matters, but also personal matters, and really were kind of a hub, if you think of it uh, in that way, um, for all of the domestic staff. So Elmore is writing to Mr. McElroy and he says, the car and shipment of household goods have been received today, the last of them all in good shape, Elmore. So James Elmore is living permanently up in Pride's Crossing, Massachusetts, year round. And June is about the time that the Frick family would have been transitioning to Eagle Rock to spend their summer. And so this note is telling us that Elmore has you know, received the, the, the things that were being sent up in preparation for the family's arrival have been received and are in good order. So just a little glimpse into um, how these things took place. This is another note. Um, this is one of my favorite things I think I've ever found in the archives because of its very simplicity, I guess, um, the basicness of it. So this is a note on stationery, Eagle Rock Prides Crossing stationery, dated September 19th, I believe it's 19, uh, 1907, I think it is. Um, yes, September 1907. 
Um, this is a letter from Joseph Holroyd, who is the butler for the Frick family at Clayton in Pittsburgh. Um, he transitions with the family to New York and to Pride's Crossing, and then um, eventually his brother takes over. John Holroyd takes over for Joseph um, sometime after, after 1910. Um, but this is Joseph Holroyd, the butler, writing to Mr. McElroy, again, who factors into this. And he is writing to him and saying, Mr. McElroy, dear sir, Will you please call up Spencer, Spencer Ford at Clayton, and ask him the name of the stuff he used to clean the Holland shade at the house with and send one dozen cases to 640 Fifth Avenue, New York. Very truly, yours very truly, uh, Jay Holroyd. This is a wonderful note. Essentially, they need to know Holland shade is a, is a blind. It's a pull down blind. And, um, Holroyd wants to know what do you what does Spencer clean the shades of Clayton with and can you tell me and send some to New York um, 645th Avenue is the Vanderbilt home that the Fricks are renting in New York um, for, for about 10 years so just the, the very sort of nitty grittiness of some of these notes I think make them wonderful and fun and you know just a very small window into the um, communication that was essential to, to be able to manage these various households and uh, keep things going in the way that the Frick family um, wanted and expected. Um, one can only imagine the level of communication and um, busyness and effort that went into um, preparing for some of the larger events. I mean, day-to-day -day life is one thing, but getting ready for house parties and um, larger events would have really been um, quite something for a staff, particularly for those who were used to busy, but perhaps um, slightly quieter, smaller life at Clayton. So I'll just end with um, another story. Um, the archives, you know, we are so fortunate at the Frick Pittsburgh to not only have the things that the family lived with, but also to have um, images of some of the people who worked for them. And again, as I said, more work um, is there to be done as we piece together faces and names and stories when we can. Um, but this is a photograph of a gentleman named Percy Martin who worked for the Fricks from 1901 until 1933. Um, I can't stress how rare this is. So many historic homes and properties don't have the kinds of documentation that let us see faces and know names and know um, more about the people who worked, who worked, you know, behind, downstairs, if you will, um, in, in these homes. Um, Percy Martin, his name appears on that 1906 payroll I showed you. He is listed as a chorman. Um, it seems that as though the Fricks came into contact with Percy when they were renting homes in Pride's Crossing um, in the summers before they built their own Eagle Rock. And at some point, they made him part of the permanent Eagle Rock staff. Um, Percy's story is one among several of people who worked for the family who had very long, even lifetime careers um, with the Fricks. On several occasions, their work and devotion was acknowledged by the Frick through pensions, um, support in times of illness, and other commemorative ways. In 1935, um, Helen Clay Frick, her parents are, have passed away, um, Helen Clay Frick requested and the Board of Trustees approved um, memorial inscriptions for John Holroyd and Percy Martin to be engraved on the walls of the garden court at what is now the Frick Collection. Um, her mother had passed away in 1931, the Frick, their New York home had opened as the Frick Collection, and Helen wanted there to be these commemorative plaques for two of the, the men who had worked with and for the family for years. Um, the, the original wording on the inscriptions was deemed too long to fit on one stone each. Um, so here's the language that she had wanted. In lasting appreciation of Percy Monroe Martin's steadfast loyalty and faithful service in behalf of the Frick, on behalf of the Frick family and this collection from 1901 until 1933. And the other said, in grateful recognition of John Holroyd's devoted care of the Frick collection from 1911 until 1914, and from 1914 to 1931, when he was superintendent of the original building. Um, so these are two men who worked for her parents, for her, and it's just very interesting that she wanted their names to be a part of the, the physical structure of the building. Um, the inscription idea was apparently abandoned. Uh, the plaques were made at some point. Um, I don't know if they were hung or for how long, um, but it's a very interesting um, story in the archives that, you know, Helen Clay Frick wanted them to be acknowledged for their contributions to both the family and to the building. 
So I'm going to end with this photograph. Um, this is a, a photo of Percy Martin and Adelaide Frick at Eagle Rock. Um, the date is unknown, but you see that Percy is um, pushing Adelaide in a wheeled chair, um, taking her outside. And there is just, you know, so much in this photograph. Um, you're seeing a very personal connection. Um, you know, he is helping us, her, assisting her so that she can move about. It's a very personal thing, but at the same time, he is employed by her. Um, he works for her. Um, and I, I just wanted to show this because it's another sort of glimpse of, of life at Eagle Rock. Um, Mrs. Frick loved Eagle Rock and spent every year there, a lot of time there, even after Mr. Frick passed away. And that's actually where she passes away in 1931. Thank you for um, joining me for a little exploration into some of the domestic staff stories um, for the people who lived and, and worked at Eagle Rock. Um, we will have two more segments in this little Eagle Rock series. Um, the next one will be presented by Kim Cady, our assistant curator for the Car and Carriage Museum, who will talk about James Elmore and the carriages and horses that we have in, currently in our Car and Carriage Museum that actually were moved um, up to Eagle Rock in the early 1900s and lived there permanently and served the family there for many, many years. So that is our next Eagle Rock adventure. Um, thank you very much for joining me. It was a pleasure to be with you and um, have a good day. We'll see you again soon.